That's awesome. Well, it's Father's Day, and I was uh, thinking through uh, what did I want to teach today. And, of course, uh, I chose the, the prodigal dad, and Rick's already covered it. <laughs> it's not like we're not working together. Uh, actually, I did not... Um, pick the prodigal son. I was thinking about what I could talk about. I could talk about Father Abraham. I could talk about uh, the challenges of, the, uh, of Joseph, the father of Jesus, you know, all of, all of which uh, are good stories. I could talk about currently what's happening with, uh, with America and fatherhood, but uh, I chose something highly unusual. Not working. Hit the middle of my screen. Oh. Pull it down. Pull it down. I'm an idiot. <laughs> Matter of fact, I went to the bookstore. I went to the bookstore and I, I was looking for something to teach me how to run a computer, and they got uh, they got computers for dummies. And then they got computers for idiots. So I'm standing there for the longest time trying to decide, am I a dummy or am I an idiot? And so, so what I did is I bought both books, <laughs> thinking I'd, I'd read one and discover if I'm, a, if I'm a dummy or an idiot. And once I knew, then I could really concentrate on that book. But uh, I read the dummy book and decided I was a complete idiot and took both of them back. So... Uh, but what I want to talk to you about is the father of a queen. Father of a queen. I'm taking a risk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into the book of Esther. And, and the queen of Esther is right over there. <laughs> Sandy knows Esther like backward, forward, upside down, sideways. So everything I screw up today, Sandy will clear up later. <laughs> but what I want to do is I want to do this a little different. I want to take you through Esther uh, through the eyes of Mordecai. Mordecai was uh, Esther's father, but I want to do it like we're at VBS. So this is not, I'm not going to go through a bunch of scripture with you. I'm going to tell you a story because it's a great story. Story about a father of a, of a queen. And, uh, and, and let me just give you a little, little historical background. Uh, this is a setting. It's a, it, it's a city named Sosa. And uh, this is 500 years before the birth of Christ. Now, to put it in context for you, the 70-year captivity has just ended. And it ended about three years prior to this. And so Nehemiah and Ezra, Zerubbabel, they have all returned to Israel and they have rebuilt Jerusalem. And they did that because of the kindness of the, of the uh, Persian leaders. And so we see that even now in history. Uh, where Sosa is at, it's, it's in Iran, and it's still a city to this day. It's one of the most famous ancient cities because it served as the capital for the Persian empires. And so all the Alexander the Great people like that have all been to Sosa, and they've dug it out, and you can go there today if you want to go to Iran, and, uh, and you can actually still see the city. It's, it's got a new name. The new name is Shursha. And so we see that it still exists. The idea here, though, is I want you to understand uh, that Esther is a drama about the Jews that stayed behind. There's no clear reason why they stayed behind, because once they stayed behind, they became a major minority. Uh, if, you, if you think about it, this was the city of Daniel, and if you go there, Daniel's tomb is still there. But some of the Jews felt called to stay, even though many of them left and went back to Israel and to Jerusalem. And this, a part of the group was Mordecai. And Mordecai had a young cousin. And for whatever reason, all the young, uh, the young cousin's parents had perished. And there's no evidence as to why, but Esther was a young girl. And, uh, and so because she was a young girl, there was a... He was, Mordecai was trying to figure out what he would do with Ezra. Now, he could have sent, I mean, with, uh, with Esther. He could have sent Esther along with the Jews that were leaving, and somebody would have 
cared for her as father and mother. But for whatever reason, Mordecai makes the decision that he's going to keep the little cousin and raise her by himself. There's no evidence that uh, Mordecai was married. There was evidence that he was a strong Jewish man, that he stayed at the gate. He was probably one of the main leaders for the Jews at that time, even though they were a minority. It, it's, a, it's an interesting book because uh, uh, it's the only book, well, there's two books in the Bible that don't mention God. And Esther is one of them. Anybody got a clue what the other one is? Song of Solomon. And yet, although God's name is not mentioned here, the provident, providential hand of God is all over the story and all over the book. There are uh, several people, in, several characters in the story. First is, is the man Mordecai. And we're going to look at what Mordecai does and what kind of father Mordecai was. We'll also see Esther. And Esther was, of course, a beauty and became a queen. And then King Xerxes. And King Xerxes is a, a major player in this. King Xerxes had 127 providences. He was in charge of all of the land or had had captured all the land from India to Ethiopia. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, uh, the law of the Medes and Persians? It comes from this particular time frame. Because Xerxes wasn't just the king, of, uh, a Persian king. He was presenting himself like a god. And as a matter of fact, whatever he said, it became law. I mean, he would sit on his throne, he had his golden scepter, and if you wanted to enter in, he would raise the scepter up and allow you in. If he ignored you, you better get out of the hallway. Because if you didn't get out of the hallway, he'd just take you out and slaughter you. And, and so he's, he sits there and he's running, his, he's running his, uh, all that he owns. And he sees himself as this major player in the world. Matter of fact, he sees himself as God. Every time he makes a statement, it becomes law. And it becomes such a law that he can't even override it. So if he makes a law, it's a law. Thus the law of the Medes and Persians. Well, the, when the story begins, they're having a party. This is the third year of his reign. And the party is a, a huge banquet. And the only instructions that all of, all of the people had were to make sure that everybody got as much as they wanted to drink. Now, the party lasted a while. The party lasted 180 days. How many of you have ever been to a six-month party? I mean, just imagine. I mean, people were coming from all over the world. Certainly, uh, 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 Xerxes and, and his crew were the only ones that made the whole 180 days, but people were coming and going, and they were celebrating him and setting him up to be even more of a king. And so they had this tremendously long party. Can you just imagine people passing out in the corner, and they come in two later, and then another group passes out for a while? And uh, it wasn't what you would call a godly gathering by any means. Uh, and so uh, after, after the 180-day party, Xerxes decides he wants to have another party for seven days. And so he takes the 180-day party and he invites only men to a party and he takes it out into his garden. And so it's, it's an all-men party out in the garden and the same rules apply. Drink all you want to drink. And he's got a queen. The queen is, uh, is, is uh, named Vasti. And Vasti is, uh, is summoned to come out and be in the party. Uh, so when he says to her, I want you to join us at the party, and he sends his people to get her, and she's a beautiful queen. Well, she says no. She refuses to come. And it makes him angry. Now, <laughs> I'm thinking... Um, this is probably going to be a Me Too moment. Seven drunk guys carrying on. I'm trying to think, what is the reason for Xerxes to invite his queen into that element? It probably wasn't to check her intellect. And so she said, no, I'm not coming. I'm not, I'm not coming into a, a place where there's seven drunken men. And she gives up being the queen. She basically says, I'm out of here. And it makes Xerxes so angry that he's trying to figure out what he can do. And so in, uh, in, 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 chapter, um, in chapter 1, verse 20, am I there? Yes. In chapter 1, verse 20, it says, And when the king decreed which he, he shall uh, make 
he, sh he shall make, I'm having, I got one eye that's messing up. I need to take it out. It's, it's bad. Oh, no. There we go. Ah, making me dizzy. And when the king's decree, which he shall make, shall be published throughout all of his kingdom, all wives will give to their husbands honor, both great and small. See, he got so mad at Vashti that he, he made this law that if you were a wife, you had to honor your husband, no matter what he said. You had to do what you were told, and if you couldn't do what you were told, he could get rid of you. And so he sends it out. Now, they had a very, a very interesting way of, uh, of mailing out decrees. When he made a decree, he wanted, it, he wanted it passed out. So they had special horses that guys would get on just like, the, uh, just like the, the Wells Fargo of old. They would get on these horses, and they would ride it all the way to the end of every providence that he was in, and the new law was posted. So if you're in the Persian area, if you're within his providences and you get this law, it's bad news for your wife because whatever you say, she has to honor it. And so he, he made that law, and he made it because he was angry. Ah, thus the plot thickens. So now we get to, we get to scene two, and in scene two what we find is uh, we have to find a new queen. He can't be without a queen, so the only thing he can think to do is have a star search, have a beauty pageant, bring, bring the most beautiful women in all of the provinces and bring them before the king and let the king decide who he wants to be his wife. And among those is Esther. Now, Esther has a different name than, than what we know her as. As a matter of fact, in 2.7, it's talking about uh, Mordecai, and it says, this man had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadassah, and that was her Persian name, who was also called Esther. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family, and he raised her as his own daughter. Now, you need to understand that when, when, you, see, when you hear the word, her name, Hadassah, that name means dazzling beauty. And so all these gals were were set up and, and had makeup and they went into wardrobe and they did all the things. You know, if you ever watch a, a pageant, you go backstage and they, they're, they're messing with their hair, they're messing with their makeup, they're making sure the clothes are just right, they're doing all that and they're parading all these women in front of the king. And, he, and he's one by one deciding which is gonna stay and which is gonna go and, and, uh, and, and he, he decides. Um, I have a friend who one day was invited uh, to go upstairs uh, in Las Vegas to Elvis Presley's uh, room. And she was invited up there for a dinner date. And uh, she went up there and, and, I mean, you can imagine, she thought that was pretty special, gonna have dinner with Elvis Presley. And when she got up to the room, they put her in another room with six other girls. And she sat in a room with six other girls and, it, and they waited there for several minutes, and Elvis came in with a robe on, and he was drying his hair, and he looked around the room, and he pointed at the one he wanted, and he left. And then the rest were dismissed. And she was part of the dismissed ones. But after she was dismissed, some of his crew said, well, I'll take you to dinner, and she said, no way, I'm out of here. So it's the same kind of thing. The king is going to pick. He's also still going to have a harem but he's gonna have a dazzling queen. She is there to be the, the, the beautiful presentation of the fact that he's a king, and she's going to be this dazzling beauty. And so he, he, as he looks at him, he decides on Esther. But Mordecai decided to be her father. You know, um, just kind of parenthetically, when, uh, when, you, when you're a young couple and you become pregnant, uh, the mom has the baby from the get-go. She first realizes something's growing, and through those nine months, you know, it, she's the one having the indigestion. Uh, she's the one having the morning sickness. 
you know, I, I love to see real pregnant women, and I, I just tell them, you know, your pregnancy has just gone so fast for me. Uh, <laughs> I've been comfortable the whole time. I've been able to eat Mexican food. It's just been wonderful. But then they just look at you like they're going to kill you, you know? And, and the idea is there's this bonding that begins at the very beginning of life that men don't know anything about. We are absolutely clueless. And every time the baby moves, the mother tells somebody. Middle of the night, the baby will move. They're waking you up. Baby's moving. Good. I'm sleeping. Uh, but it's moving in her body. And there is some mental, physical connection that a man will never have with a child that only a mother can have, right? Amen. I mean, it's just, it's just there. And when that baby comes, they, they have just a continuance of that. It's not like that with a guy. I mean, we don't, we don't go through the pain. We don't go through the effort I remember watching our first child being born. I mean, uh, I, I didn't want to see all that. Did you? I mean, I, I'm standing there like a catcher waiting for the little guy to come out. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then finally he's out, and you realize he's safe and everything. And, and the mother, they immediately put the child up on the mother. And it's her first time to see that baby, and further bonding happens. Later, I'm standing in front of a window where there's a bunch of other babies. You know, I love when people say, that's a beautiful baby. No, babies look like Winston Churchill. <laughs> because of what they've been through, the little cramped space they've had to come out of. They just are ugly, right? And so I'm looking through all the ugly little babies trying to figure, and then there's the name, and I see mine, my ugly little baby. <laughs> and that's when it first dawns on me, and I have this thought, what on earth have I done? I mean, I'm in. There's no getting out of it, whether I want this or not. I remember going home that night without Donna, without the baby, and I remember just staring for hours like, I'm a dad? <laughs> Me? I, I mean, what was I, 22, 23? I, I was too young and too stupid to be a dad, for sure. But it was too late. And so, you know, when you're a dad and you've not had the baby with you, and then somebody hands you the baby, so you hold it, right? You don't know what to do, and, and everybody's going, get its head, get its head. <laughs> not on the top, that's still soft. You'll, you'll give it brain damage. You know, I'm like, take it back, I, you know. Uh, so we're just no good, we're worthless. Uh, I used to tell Donna, I, I just don't hear the baby crying, or I'd get up and feed it. And, uh, and, and so one night she got up and ran into the door. And she said, well, you heard it enough to go shut the door. You didn't hear it enough to go feed it. So there's this, this effort. Matter of fact, now we're real sophisticated. We try to help the men bond with the baby before the baby's ever here. And, and uh, that's not working. So... <laughs> The idea, I, and, and you bond as a father when the baby can hang with you, when the baby can talk, when the baby can walk. Then you start realizing, okay, all right, I, I got to jump in here and be a dad. And you have to make a choice. I remember one time Donna was giving me the kids and she was telling me, I'm going to go here. And I said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'll babysit them. Boy, she turned around. Her head whipped around like the exorcist. She said, you will not babysit them. You will parent them. That's the last time I ever said I'd babysit them. I'm parenting now. I got it. I got it. I know what I'm supposed to do. And so the idea is that, that Mordecai took all that on. He made a decision. And he didn't make a decision with a little boy. He made a decision for the, with a little girl. And he raised that little girl. And he raised her to, to, to have faith and to understand things. And and he made an active, unbelievable choice, unselfish kind of choice. And I, I would say that's a great example, guys, for us. We need to make a choice as a father. Uh, Rick was talking about even when we're older, we need to make a choice to reach out to our children. We need to make a choice to continue to be in their lives, 
make a choice to be a dad. I don't know where we got in our society that when they got to be a certain age, we just push away and go, there you go, you're on your own. No. We make a choice to hang in there, stay with them if we're older. If we're younger, we need to make a choice on our way home from work to put work aside and, and make a choice, make a choice to be a dad. Uh, that first occurred to me, and, and, and I, I had to make the choice because I would get home and Donna goes, here they are. <laughs> Take them. Take them anywhere. Uh, maybe don't bring them back, except I bonded those nine months. So the idea, you know, is you've got to... You've got to make a decision to shut things down to be a dad. You can't be all preoccupied all over the place and be the kind of dad you were supposed to be. And from the courage and from, from the, uh, what we see out of Queen Esther eventually, we know that it was her dad and it was the choice that he made to love her that, that built character in here. And, and he understood all that. And he understood that was his to do. And so we see Mordecai doing that. Well, as our plot thickens, uh, we see that there's a plot to kill the king. And Mordecai actually saves the king. In, uh, in chapter 2, verse 23, it says, When an investigation was made and Mordecai's story was found to be true, the two men, who were, who were, uh, two men were impaled on a sharpened pole. And this was all recorded in the book of the history of King Xerxes' reign. That's very important. What, you wonder why the writer would put that in there, that they wrote that down. Later, that's going to be very important in the story. Now, here's what happens. There's these two guys, Big Thana and Turish. Doesn't that sound like a couple of criminals? I mean, that sounds like a couple of guys sitting in an Italian restaurant, right? Having a bowl of spaghetti. Who's that? That's Big Tana and Turish. Don't mess with them. And these were guys who were at the banquet. Matter of fact, these two guys made the seven-day party. And yet they had a plot. They were going to kill the king. And Mordecai overheard the plot. Mordecai told Esther about the plot. And the king was saved. So we have Mordecai, the Jew, saving the Persian king. And, and it, uh, that's very important to the story because when we get to the next scene, we see a father that's going to help his daughter find her purpose in life. Now, before we get there, we have an enemy that they're going to be dealing with. His name is Haman. Now, Haman was an awful person. Haman was the Darth Vader of King Xerxes. Now, when Haman entered the room, you almost hear, dun, 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 comes in. He's this awful, awful man. Matter of fact, uh, he made Hitler look nice. He hated the Jews. He made himself second in command, and nobody really knows historically how this man came to that kind of power, but he, but he came to that kind of power. And wherever he walked, his expectation was, when you saw Haman, you bowed down to him. And if you didn't bow down, uh, he was going to punish you and probably kill you. But guess who wouldn't bow down? Mordecai. Mordecai would only bow to Jehovah God. And so every time, every time Haman saw Mordecai, he just got more and more angered that this man will not bow down to him. And so he came up with an idea, and his idea was to, uh, was to, to uh, annihilate the Jews. Same idea that Hitler had. And his idea was to get the king, get the king to write a law that on a certain date, every Jew would be annihilated. And that would be, that would be the job of every, every other person who wasn't a Jew. And so if you were, if you were Greek or Gentile or whatever you were in whatever region uh, you reached out to, your job was to kill whatever Jew, man, woman, or child, that was around you. And then you could take all of their possessions. And it was set to happen on a specific date. And all that... All that was going on, and Mordecai heard that Haman had convinced the king to make that law. And so Haman puts on sackcloth and ashes, and he begins to wail and weep and, and, and fast and do all of that. And, and, of course, Esther hears about it. Matter of fact, at one point, he walked all the way up to the palace, weeping and weeping for the, for the people of Israel, weeping for every Jew. 
And, and as he made his way up to the palace, continuing to weep, she tried to connect with him through, uh, through the people that she had, and then finally, uh, they have a conversation. And in the conversation, uh, he, talks about, uh, he talks about purpose. So in, in chapter 4, verse 14, he says, If you keep quiet at this time, like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. Now, they don't know, they don't know that Esther is a Jewish or a Jewess. They kept that quiet. I'm, I'm sure Mordecai kept that on the down low as she was, as she was uh, with him because she would have way more opportunity if, the, if nobody thought that she was a Jewess. And yet now, if she remains silent, bad things are going to happen. And he's telling her. He's telling her. He's, he's a, a man having a conversation with his daughter. And it says, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. Here's a father also expressing a lesson about God. And the lesson is, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to lay this entire thing on you. If you don't come through, God will still provide. God will always provide. We are, we are God's people, and God will always have a remnant of our people. Now, he knew that. He knew that, and so he prefaces what he's about to say by saying that. And then he says what he thinks is Esther's real purpose. When he goes on, he says, uh, he says, but you and your relatives will die. You won't be spared. Once they find out you're a Jew, you'll be gone, I'll be gone. Everybody that you know will be gone. And then he, he mentions this, who knows if perhaps you, you were made queen for such a time as this. How many of you ever heard that quoted? except they only quote that part. You know, we're here for such a time as this. And he's saying, perhaps, perhaps daughter, perhaps lovely daughter of mine, this is your purpose. This is it. This is your moment. This is the will of God in your life. Great dads know how to take care of that. Great dads know how to square up with their children and recognize they have purpose. How difficult this must have been for a dad to give a daughter that kind of challenge. He was getting ready to send her into a very dangerous situation. I mean, now, now we got these helicopter pa uh, parents. You know, they won't send their kid into any dangerous situation. They hover over them, and, and, they, and they never grow. They grow, up, they grow up to be millennials, <laughs> and they don't understand failure. Everybody gets a trophy. Everything that happens to you is good because you're my child. It takes a real dad with great wisdom to understand sometimes you got to put your child in harm's way or express to them, I'm sending you, I, I'm blessing you, and I know out of, your own, out of your own character, you are heading into a place that is dangerous and could be the end of you. But if it's God's purpose, I let you go. We have a hard time sending our kids to college. We have a hard time letting them go to Scotland. I mean, we, we get crazy. And here's a dad who's standing there, and he's telling his daughter this. Kind of my second point about dads is that, you know, character is caught, not taught. It's caught, not taught. If, if you're under the, under the illusion that it was taught, think about the lectures you got from your dad that you paid absolutely no attention to. You know, most dads are KIAs, but when a dad begins to lecture, 
Son, sit here and let me tell you what, what, what needs to happen for you. He turns into Charlie Brown's teacher. It's blah, 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 blah. Especially if he hasn't shown it in his own life. What your children learn from you, they learn from catching it, not having you teaching it. I was thinking about that the other day because, you know, my dad, of course, he's been gone since 2012. And I think of some things that I caught from him and the character kind of things that I know that are in me and I wonder where they're coming from. And certainly you give glory to God, but I saw them in my dad. And I am, I am thrilled to say the character that I saw in my dad appears in me. And it appears in the, the rest of the people in my family. I don't know why I thought of this, but I was about 14. My dad, uh, you know, when, I, when we were young, we didn't have any money. I mean, he was trying to be an upholster because his dad was an upholster. And he was trying to please his dad, who was unpleasable. And, and finally, somebody said to him, uh, they said, Corky, you've got such a great personality and people like you. You need to be a salesman. And so about the time I was 11 or 12, my dad stopped being an upholster and he started selling fabric. And when he started selling fabric, he was great at it. We went from being stuck in a, a, like a ghetto area to moving to to the equivalent of a Frisco or a Plano, kind of overnight. I went from from being in a, a, a bad neighborhood Graduating from the sixth grade, and by the time I was in the seventh grade, we were in a fancy neighborhood. Everybody had a pool. You know, everybody, everybody looked rich to me. My dad was no longer working three or four jobs. He was working just the one, and he was succeeding at it. It was amazing. And he had gotten another job where he started selling wall covering, and that was a big popular thing. And, and Naga Hyde had just come out and my dad said, you know how many nagas it takes to get a hide? And you know, I mean, he, I remember he took me downtown LA with him because it was close to Christmas and we were gonna go Christmas shopping. And he said, I gotta go down to work, I'll take you with me. And he said, the guys are all gonna be there and the boss wants a quick meeting with us. And I got in on that. I'm about 13 or 14 and I walked in there and this boss is this loud, arrogant sort of guy, and he's got his six salesmen in there, and he's got a chalkboard up there, and he's bragging about them and all the great business they did, and he said, since y'all did so great, I got Christmas bonuses for everybody, and he had written checks, and he'd tear those checks off, and he'd hand them to the salesman, and the salesman would shake his hand, and, you know, and and thank him for it, and go to the next, the next, the next. My dad got his, you know, they all busted out a beer and took a couple drinks and then they all left. Merry Christmas to everybody. And, and my dad said, uh, come on, we, I, gotta, I gotta do something before we go. And, uh, and he said, run out the car and get my checkbook. And so I did. And I watched my dad, the only one left, he walked over to the guy that, that sat at the order desk. So when he's out selling, He sells it, and then whatever he sells, he calls it in to a guy at an order desk, and that guy has to put the order together. And my dad wrote out a check for that guy, out of his check. And then we went out in the back, and there's a guy named Loopy. I remember him. And he drove the forklift that would pull the materials out and put them on the UPS truck. My dad wrote him out a check. There was a couple other guys there in the warehouse my dad wrote out he wrote out five or six checks and I watched him do it and the whole time I'm thinking what are you doing we could have a real Christmas you got a lot of money and you're giving it all away and I remember going home I asked him I said dad what what are you doing and he said you take care of the people that take care of you he said Always remember that. You take care of of the people that take care of you. And they're not the little people, they're the important people. Because nothing you do happens until they do their job in partnership with you. So you take care of those those people. Don't tell your mother I gave a bunch of people money. (laughs) So now, Armed with the advice of her pop, 
she goes back in and she doesn't know how she's going to even get to talk to the king. King hasn't requested her in a long time. And the date's coming. The date when they're going to attack every Jew is coming. And she doesn't know what to do. And she tells, she tells Mordecai, I, I don't know what to do. I, I mean, I'll try to get in and see the king. I'll beg for mercy. I'll do whatever. But you know what? She was also very savvy. Very savvy. So she decided to kind of force the issue. To be able to get in and see the king, she had to do something special. So what she did is she went in and she put on a very beautiful outfit. Dare I say something extremely sexy. That's a good place for me to tell you, ladies, flannel pajamas are never sexy. <laughs> never. And anything with feet in them is just off limits, okay? <laughs> I mean, I hate flannel. It kind of makes me itch, you know? And, and, you know, and, this, you know and, and not an ugly T-shirt, you know, none of that stuff. And, and you know, you wear, you wear stuff all the time around the house, and then this wasn't an around-the-house deal. She knew, I got to get the attention of the king. She also knew the way to get the attention of the king is through his eye. And so what she does is she just kind of wanders over and stands in front of the door. And the king looks up and, you know, sees her. And, and I mean, he's like, "Woo, <laughs> Hubba, hubba, hubba. <laughs> Which is all Hebrew for, what would you like? Come on in. I mean, he raised the scepter and said, get in here, you know. And, and when he got her in there, he says, my, what do you want? Isn't that the way of a man? I mean, you get his attention at that level, and it's kind of a, what do you, I'll give you anything. What do you want? What do you, yeah, here. Uh, and, and that's where he was. He was so taken by her beauty. And she is so smart. She says, you know, i tell you what I'd really like. I'd love to have a nice little banquet with just you and Haman. And he said, well, you got it. I, I mean, I'd give you half of my kingdom for the way you look. And that's all you want? Yes, just a banquet with you and Haman. And so Haman comes, and they have their little banquet. They have their little time together. And, uh, and, and it, it all seems innocent. And during the banquet, he's going, what do you want? What do you? And she said, I want another banquet tomorrow with you and Haman. And he said, Seriously, I'm, I'm ready to give you half of my kingdom. Looking as good as you do, I, you know, it's yours. But okay. And so Haman walks out, and, and as he walks out, of course, he encounters Mordecai. And as he encounters Mordecai, and everybody's bowing down, Mordecai's standing, standing tall. And he's saying, I'm going to get that guy. I'm going to get him. And he goes home, and he's so angry, he, he, had, he builds this 75-foot pole. And, and back then, the way, they would, the way they would kill people is they would impale them on a pole. 75 foot in his backyard. I mean, right there in his area, he's got this huge pole. And now he's got in his mind, that's what I'm going to do to Haman. I'm going to bring him. I'll put him on that 75-foot pole, and people will be able to see him for miles. And, they, you know, they'll see what not bowing down to me gets. And, and then, you know, he, then he, the next morning he gets up and he knows he's going to go to the banquet that night. He goes in to do business with the king. Well, what he didn't know was the king had trouble sleeping the night before, probably indigestion from something that he ate at the banquet. But he just, he had in, he just didn't know what to do. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't fall asleep. And so he decided to, you remember back in chapter 2 where it says they wrote it in the records? He decides to read the records. I'm thinking, what an odd thing. But if you've got something you read when you can't sleep, because you know it'll put you to sleep, you know, try Leviticus. That'll knock you out. Just, you know, something that just, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, but, it's, but it's, it's boring. And so he goes back to the records, and what does he read in the records? There was a plot to kill him, and Mordecai thwarted the plot. And so he, he, calls, he calls his servants in. He said, did we ever do anything for Mordecai? I mean, the guy saved my life. No, we've never done anything. And so that morning when Haman comes, the king looks at Haman. And he says, hey, Haman. He said, uh, 
He said, how would you reward somebody who had, uh, who had just served you in a wonderful way? And he said, well, king, he said, I'd put a crown on his head and I'd, I'd take one of my royal robes. Of course, Haman thinks he's talking about him. Haman's all excited, so I'm going to give him all these really good ideas. And, and one of the ideas was he gets to wear the, the king's robe, he gets to wear a crown, and they're going to put him on the king's stallion with the king's marker on it and take him downtown and parade him all up and down the streets so that all the people can see and praise this person who has served his king. And, he, he, and, and so Haman's thinking about it. He's saying, man, this is going to be great. And then, and then, then he looks at him and he says, that's a great idea. I love every one of those suggestions. He said, go do that for Mordecai. <laughs> Mordecai, the guy he can't stand. Mordecai, the one he can't wait to kill. Mordecai, the one who stands for God and never bows down to Haman. And so Haman has to swallow big, and he has to go do that for Mordecai. And when he, he goes home that night, and he's angry, and so angry and bitter, and he's talking to his, his, uh, his, his crew, and he's talking to his wife, and about then they come and get him for the next banquet. So now he has to go back into this banquet. You know, Don and I do a lot of banquets. Do you ever not want to go to a banquet and you know you got to go? It's bad. I mean, it's real bad. Well, you don't feel like going to a banquet. You're frustrated. Maybe some of the people that are at the banquet, you're kind of angry at. You don't want to go, you know. And, and you, you go to the banquet, and you put on a big smile because you're at the banquet. Sometimes you're the guest speaker. And you got to grin through it and do all that. Oh, that's Haman, man. He's, he, do, he did not want to go to this banquet. But he goes. He goes because that's where the king wants him. And I'm sure he's thinking in his head, well, the date's going to come. I'm going to kill all those Jews. And, you know, Mordecai's going to still be one of them. And, and he walks in just like Darth Vader. And he sits down. And once again, the king looks at Esther. And he says, babe, what do you want? I'll give you half of my kingdom. And she reveals her Jewishness. What do you want? And she points Haman out and said, this is a bad guy. He's evil. I want him out. And, and she, she recognizes that she has to tell the king, I'm Jewish. And when the king learns it, the king could care less that she's Jewish at this point. And now he's angry at Haman because Haman has tricked him into making a law that's going to kill every Jew. And he realizes, I'm going to lose another queen. And I don't want to lose this one. And he's so angry, he gets up and he storms out. And while he storms out, Haman comes over and he leans on, he leans on Esther's couch, which means he comes over to Esther and almost throws himself on her and begins to beg for mercy. And the king comes in and sees that. He doesn't like that at all. And so they put a sack over that guy's head and carry him out, and he is impaled on the 75-foot thing that he had prepared for Mordecai. The rest of the story is awesome because they can't change the law. They make another law that warns everybody of what's about to happen. And so we see that a wonderful Jewish queen gets all the credit for saving the Jewish nation. But guess where her energy came from? Guess where the wisdom came from? Where the courage came from? Came from a dad. Came from a dad who had a, enough sense to, to recognize that, that his daughter can make a difference. So I want, you to, I want you to think about these three things related to this story. The first one is never underestimate the providence of God. God's name is not mentioned in this book, but God's providence is all over this book. The whole story is about how God is protecting the Jewish people. And, and how in God's providence, what are the chances that a single man would take on a little girl to raise? What are the chances that she would grow up and be the most beautiful girl in the land and end up being the queen of a king? There's no chance here. This is the providence of God. And, and so we see, 
we see that that's, that's an important issue in our lives. And there's so many times we don't recognize the providence of God. And yet it's there. The second thing I would say to you, never underestimate the influence of a good father. Never underestimate, especially if you're a dad. Don't underestimate your ability to be a good father to your children. That it will build courage, that will, will make them be excited about doing God's will, that will give them the kind of challenge that they need and want to live a life that God wants them to live. And, you know, I, I know when I say that not everybody, not everybody had a good example for a dad. I get that. But even if you didn't, and you're a father, be a great father. And the third thing, never underestimate the significance of a disciple. Never underestimate your own children. Once they have followed the Lord and you watch them and you see the things that they can do for God. And you recognize that that came, that came through you in many ways. That the way they think about God, the way they respond to him, the fact that they're in the faith, the fact that they know him, how important that is. I look at these little guys, I look at these little guys that were at VBS. You know, uh, they're, they're eight or nine years old, 10 maybe, like that, they're going to be 18. Somewhere between that and that, they're going to be 18. And as a church, we have an obligation to father them, to build into them. That's why I want, I want you all praying that we find just the right person to come and be our youth pastor because all of them are going to be teenagers. Like we're going to blink and they're going to be teenagers. And there are kids out here who need the fathering of a church. They need somebody that has the wisdom of a Mordecai. And we can make a difference in people's lives. Fathers always can. I want to end my time, but I want to, I want to, I want to take you to another king who's a father of a daughter, King George VI. King George VI wasn't even going to be king. His brother was supposed to be king. But his brother married an American who had been divorced, so he couldn't be king. So they had to make King George VI the king. There was a movie about him a couple of years ago, and it like nobody thought it was going to do anything, and it took like almost every Oscar that was available, and it was about King George VI. He couldn't talk. Not without stuttering, I mean, he stuttered so badly. And he, he had a tutorer for two years. Every day, he'd see the tutorer. And he gave a famous speech in September of 1939. And it was a speech about going to war and how Germany was now their enemy. And, he, and we had to rally the troops, and it was the most significant message probably a man ever had to make in the 20th century to say, we're going the war, to war for the second time. There is no more peace. We need to get our troops together and be ready to go. And to do the speech, his speech pathologist had to stand in front of him and mouth the words to him. They had to change some of the words that were more difficult. And he was very, very slow and deliberate in his delivery. And he got it done, and everybody was just going nuts. And the guy that was, uh, the guy that was his, uh, his speech pathologist said, well, you know, he said, you did really well. You only stumbled on that one W. And he goes, no, I stumbled on purpose because I wanted them to make sure they knew it was the king. <laughs> but on Christmas, 1939, just a few months later, now used to being on the radio, he made a decision. I want to go and I want to give a Christmas message to all those who are at war. And he sat down to give this wonderful Christian message, greetings out to the men who were in the Navy, out to the men who were in the Air Force, out to the men who were in the Army, those who were home, keeping the home front safe. And, and he, he was giving this speech just before he walked in to the radio program, his 14-year-old daughter, now Queen Elizabeth II, walked up to him and said, Daddy, I found something, and you should read it. And he looked at it, 
And he said, I'll read it. So after he finished greeting all the men at war, this is what he read that was handed to him by his 14-year-old daughter. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the new year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than a light and safer than a known way. May that be all, may, may that all, may that all of us, I see I'm not doing what he did. May that all of us, the might, may all of us, anyway, he went on and said, may all of us put our hand in the mighty hand of God. Father of a king. Father who was a king. Daughter of a, of a father who was a king. She's now a queen. You look at Queen Elizabeth II. Do you see any of her father in her? She's courageous. She's smart. She's been a great leader for England. He was a great Mordecai. Father, help us to be that as fathers. A great example to achieve greatness, the greatness that you have for our children, that they might see God, know God, and Father, be able to do what it is you call them to do. I pray, Lord, that we would instill character and courage in all the things that you want our children to have, humility and love for others. God, we just pray that uh, on this Father's Day, that we thank you again for the opportunity to be a father and to have a father. We're especially thankful, God, that you are our father, a father that uh, has a secret that he tells his son, and the secret is that the love never ends. In Jesus' name, amen. In our little invitation time, we're just going to sing. I want you to, hey, if your father's in heaven, remember what a character and the kind of things that he taught you. Thank God for the father you had, for how he made you who you are. Ask God to make you even a better father, a better grandfather than you've ever been. If you need to belong to a church and you think this is a great place for you to join our fellowship, I pray that you would do that. Or perhaps you want to know more about Jesus and who God is. Whatever is your desire while we sing. In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise Give me Jesus And
Yeah. We didn't get to when I come to die. Oh, yeah, we're not going to do that <laughs> okay. today. Okay. <laughs> we did that yesterday. <laughs> oh. Don't make me sing it. All right, you can be seated. Thank you all for being here today. Um, it's a good day. Donna, do you have... Did you? Did you give it to me? I gave it to you last <laughs> night. I'll be right back. <laughs> you got to go to your car. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, we can do that if you need to run get it. Do you need to run get it? I mean, according to Xerxes, you're supposed to do exactly <laughs> what I tell you to do. <laughs> yeah. She's Esther. Oh, yeah, she's fine. There's no doubt about that. Just, uh, anyway, okay, let's go to announcements. Uh, Tuesday night, Tuesday night. I don't forget what you asked me to do. Uh, <laughs> I better watch it. Uh, I'm going to be a dead father. Um, Tuesday, Tuesday night, we're, we're wandering through the wilderness with Sandy. And uh, and I think Don is fixing Mexican, so you're going to wander through the you're going to wander through the wilderness, and then you're going to have Mexican. It doesn't get any better than that, <laughs> right? Uh, so that's uh, the 12th and the 19th. The 19th will be the next date. That's this Tuesday at 6:30, 6:30 to 7:30. And bring a friend. Uh, our new people came. Yeah, and six for dinner. Yes. So show up at six for dinner you'll be eating while you're wandering through the wilderness. That never works out well. So uh, 6 o'clock for dinner, and we're going to do that. And next week, we're having a 4th of July service on the 1st. We figure that's so much fun, we're going to do it early because on Wednesday night, 4th of July, uh, probably you'll be out being a firecracker. So we're going to do our, do our gathering this uh, July 1st. So be sure and do that. Be sure and be here for that. No, it's two weeks away. Well, you gotta. Uh, yeah, you gotta work some of this out yourself. Yeah, here we go. Coming in July. Uh, it's gonna all be about stress. As a matter of fact, Skip uh, Pilgrim is gonna be here, and he's gonna talk about stress. Now, I'll tell you something, but you got you gotta promise me. Are you, are you all gonna be here next week? Yes, sir. You promise under God in God's house you're gonna be here next week. Okay, good. Good, because Skip Pilgrim, Skip Pilgrim is coming next week, and he's going to preach. He's not only going to play the steel guitar, he's going to preach, and he's going to talk to you a lot about what he's going to share on these subsequent Wednesday nights. And so I want you... <laughs> I'm paying for that later. I'm paying big time for that later. Um, and then uh, uh, the bags. You brought more bags? You got more bags? So, so Becky has more bags. They don't look anything like that bag. And we're doing that for the prison ministry, so keep that up. And we're going to, how many bags are we trying to get to? 800. Oh, I thought we were doing 10,000. Okay, See, 800 would be so easy to get to. Uh, we can do it. All right? Um, man, they just keep coming. Wednesday night, uh, we're going to have our regular Wednesday night meal. So come at 6, and then we'll pray, and we'll have a Bible study, and we'll just enjoy ourselves, okay? So uh, with that, we had last week Charlie graduated from high school. Come on down here, Charlie. He's the man. Yeah. Look at there. Look at the pictures of Charlie. Looks like just like every kid that was at VBS. <laughs> Charlie, at least you don't look like Winston Churchill. <laughs> you grew out of that stage. Congratulations. Thanks, We're really thanks. proud of you. Uh, what are you going to do now? Uh, well, first off, I'm going to be going to NCTC for like two years. Good. And then after that two years, I'm going to be going to UNT. Awesome. So the man's got a plan. He's got a beard and everything. <laughs> I, I knew he would say something about that. I knew he would say something about that. And I hear, I hear you sing a little bit, too. 
Yeah, there you go. See, I'm just sharing secrets all over the place. Charlie, we're so proud of you. We're thankful for you, and we got you a little gift. So uh, appreciate you, and we're gonna we're gonna see you around because you're close by. So, and we <laughs> stay in your church while you're in while you're in college. Yeah, there you look at the graduate man. Looks good there. Clean shaven. Now he just looks like a dumb millennial. <laughs> All right. I tell you, I went to the Southern Baptist Convention last week, and, uh, and, and I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I'm excited about what's happening in the Southern Baptist Convention because it's getting younger, and, uh, and that's one thing, and they're pushing out all the old guys that need to go. So, you know, I look around. I'm, I'm sitting there getting ready to worship, and I look around. There's nobody my age. I guess they're in meetings, panic because they're getting pushed out. But what's there is a whole group of younger people, dynamic. They all have beards. None of them know how to dress. I saw more flip-flops and T-shirts, and, and I'm thinking, man, what, what am I doing dressed up? And so it was, but it was a great time because it's an interesting time in the Southern Baptist Convention. The, the, uh, the old guard is moving away, and the new guard's moving in. And you know what they talked about? Because it was kind of their convention. They talked about preach the word of God, be a praying people, and be a people on mission. Man, way back to the basics, solid as a rock. And so just wanted you to know that uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, although had some controversy, controversy was caused by the old guys. That younger crowd that's coming in looks very sharp to me. And so I'm excited for that. Come on, guys. Bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. And that we can always trust in you. Your blessings are abundant, and out of your great mercy, you have given us so much. We come now to return a portion of what we have been given. We pray that you'll bless these offerings and use them to extend your kingdom and your glory. We pray, pray that you will multiply their reach and influence, that many may be blessed. And we ask all this in the powerful and loving name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. This goes out to all you fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers. Lord, I hope this day is good. I'm feeling empty and misunderstood. I should be thankful, Lord, I know I should. But Lord, I hope this day is good. Lord, have you forgotten me? I've been praying to you faithfully. I'm not saying I'm a righteous man. But Lord, I hope you understand. I don't need fortune and I don't need fame. Send down a thunder, Lord, send down a rain. But when you're planning just how it will be, plan a good day for me. Lord, I hope this day is good. I'm feeling empty and misunderstood. I should be thankful, Lord, I know I should. But, Lord, I hope this day is good. You've been the king since the dawn of time. All that I'm asking is a little less crime. It might be hard for devil to do but it would be easy for you 
Lord, Lord, I hope this stays good. I'm feeling empty and misunderstood. I should be thankful, Lord, I know I should. But Lord, I hope this stays good. Yes, Lord, I hope this stays good. Have a good Sunday, everybody.